Well, thank you. Uh, before I start, I will, uh, well, before I start the introduction, I want to call your attention to these batiks. These are Mary Edna Fraser's, who many of you know, one of the great artists in Charleston who does such a wonderful job of representing the low country landscapes. We had the reception last night at the Halsey with um, both historical paintings of the low country and also modern photographs. Um, so um, anyway, we are grateful to the artists who've made those, all of those available to us. And the point of it, of course, is that as we have heard already, much of our orientation toward this, this challenge is, is not, does not come through facts. It comes through uh, our visual um, you know, in, engagement with the landscape and the emotions that, that, that those engagements evoke. So um, that is what we were trying to help understand. Um, now, today, our, our final panel we've got uh, on food will be moderated by Kim Elliman. Kim is a friend of mine from some time, and I, he, I, but I still have to refer to his bio because he has such a long bi biography, as many people have had today. Uh, but he is now the chief executive officer of the Open Space Institute in New York. The um, OSI has uh, protected more than two million acres of land and created uh, 50 new parks or protected areas in the eastern U.S. Uh, it's a wonderful organization and one that um, I say it's the most of, of effective uh, con land conservation group in America that no one's ever heard of. But some people, people in New York have heard of it, obviously. Um, Kim has worked uh, in many arenas and um, he was, but I think interestingly for our purposes, he was a director and chairman of Piggly Wiggly Southern and director of Fresh Fields Markets, which um, makes him eminently qualified to, to moderate this panel. Um, he is um, on innumerable boards, uh, foundation boards, uh, including um, the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation. He was instrumental in Grow Food receiving a grant from one of the foundations on whose board he sits. So we are grateful for that. Um, and we're very grateful for Kim coming all the way down here to be a part of this. So thank you. It was sort of an easy decision this morning. It was raining in New York, torrentially. I think it was the weather you've had the last couple of weeks. Anyway, um, it's delightful to be here. I'm happy to be here. And it's a real honor um, to be moderating this panel. Um, all the other panels have had name tags, but the, the gentleman and woman to my, lady to my left, are so well known that they've decided to forswear name tags. But So let me quickly introduce them for those who don't know them. Um, Wes Jackson, um, Joan Diagasso, and um, Michel Nisson uh, are going to be your panelists today. Uh, and you sort of know the drill by now. Um, each of them will speak sequentially, but we're going to do something slightly different in this panel. Um, we had a phone call, we decided we'd do something different, which is they will each talk for 15 minutes, and then there'll be a five-minute Q&A um, between the panelists, so they can question themselves. And at the end of that, there'll be, uh, it was going to be 25 minutes, but with an open bar at 5.30, we may have a hard close. Um, but we're going <laughs> to um, try to get done so there'll be uh, 20, 25 minutes of Q&A from the floor. Um, and just to be efficient about that Q&A, um, as the last moderator said, please make your questions crisp. I would say, please make them pithy. Um, we will take as a stipulation that you are all qualified to ask the question you're going to ask just ask the question, um, and then I think you can get more answer. Um, and if you don't ask questions, I get to ask questions, but you're far better off if you ask questions. Um, so our panelists are exceptional. Um, each one has been a pioneer, uh, each one a leader, indeed um, legends in their particular fields. The bios um, are in your materials, so I won't belabor them. Um, and if that doesn't suffice, I'm sure you can Google them all, because they've all written, they've all um, been active. Just don't Google them now. Listen to them. You'll learn a lot. Um, you can Google them later. Um, so uh, Wes, quickly, as the bio says, is president of the Lancet Institute in Salinas, Kansas. Uh, you're not in Kansas anymore, Wes. I'm sure you've heard that before. Um, he's prolific, provocative as an author, as a thinker. He's widely followed, widely honored. 
Uh, he's received the MacArthur Genius Award um, 20 years ago, but that's only a five-year award, right? So you're post-genius status for 15 years, Wes? I'm still spending that down. <laughs> good, good. Um, and uh, he is the uh, principal advocate of the 50-year farm bill, um, which I'm sure you'll hear something about. Um, Joan um, is herself equally prolific, equally profound as a writer, as an educator, and as a food producer. Um, while I'm not giving away her age, decades ago, she wrote papers and books and articles uh, on concepts that today seem givens, but in, in those days, um, first introduced the concepts of the interrelationship and intersection of global industrialized food systems with human health and community health. Um, so we're really delighted uh, to have her. And Michel Nichon is a chef. Uh, he wears many hats as chefs these days, the new world, new age chefs seem to do. Um, not only is his restaurant dynamic and novel uh, in his menus and preparation, he's an award-winning author He's a media personality, um, and he'll lighten up this, this panel for us. Uh, and he has been a principal in advocating in, uh, enlightened food policy and even trying to figure out pathways, avenues of getting healthy food um, to disadvantaged people. So we're honored to have all three of you um, on the panel. Uh, the panel obviously offers the depth of perspectives. Um, there's global to local, academic to hands-on, policy to action. Um, I would ask the panelists, as you speak this afternoon and thinking about um, uh, what you're addressing, think about how a nude food system applies to the low country and also how the low country can get there from where it is today. Um, and you know, to the extent you, you can share the prescriptions um, of the low country with its rich agricultural lands, its rich agricultural history, and how it moves to the kind of market and food system that you all advocate. So without further ado, um, and I've spent less than five minutes, and Joan gets the balance of my time. Um, Wes, 15 minutes. Uh, I was asking myself, why am I here? And I'm here because several years ago, Strong Donnelly brought me down here. And uh, that's when I met Dana. And uh, I see Kira, his daughter, is here. Strawn's daughter, and I'm glad to see the, uh, the tradition uh, go on. Um, well, over 30 years ago, um, Alan and Joan Gusso uh, came to the Land Institute. I'm not going to tell you how old she is, uh, but she's over 30. <laughs> so much for that. Well, what does the agriculture scorecard say? Anybody been checking the scorecard lately? The third year in a row, we have eaten more food and wasted it than has been produced. The stocks are down. We're losing, according to the United Nations, 30 million acres a year due to degradation on a global basis. That is about one eleventh of the total ag acreage in the United States. We have around roughly 330 million acres up as a result of the biofuels program going from uh, uh, 70 million acres to 90 million acres with a, um, a, uh, a subsidy uh, for ethanol that is three times what we have estimated the cost to be to have an ag ecological agriculture worldwide. We've estimated that cost, which would include training 110 PhD level scientists to be working in clusters in Asia, Africa, Latin America. That cost is 1.6 billion, and uh, three times that amount of money uh, is the current subsidy for ethanol. Um, from 1700 to 2000, we lost about a billion acres of land, uh, of what was agricultural land. Uh, the other day, I saw a storm was going through Iowa and Illinois and Indiana. So I got a hold of our folk. I said, look, 
get all the people on the database in northern Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, ask them if they'll go out and take pictures. You can't believe what these folk sent back to us over the internet. Gullies like this. Corn and soybeans hadn't been planted. And minimum till, no till, where they burn it off with an herbicide but don't actually scratch the ground. We've got gullies all the way through. So um, something happened uh, 10,000 years ago that I think has great philosophical importance that we're living with today. And that is over in the Zagros Mountains of western Iran, they found the wheat plant. And then later in Asia, the rice plant. And then later in the Americas, the corn plant. Those are the top three crops today in the world. Next is potato, and after that it's grains. Humans are primarily grass seed eaters, secondarily legume seed eaters, and we're stuck with the hardware, to put it in computer terms to show that I'm modern, uh, we're stuck with the hardware of the annual crop, and now we're beginning to see in our time, given the population we have, and the biofuels program and so on, uh, some of the serious consequences. Um, what happened when they planted those annual grains, you have to tear the ground up, you have to tear up nature's ecosystem and nature's ecosystems essentially all feature perennial plants that are there year round that are grown in mixtures and that's the beginning of the idea that's ricocheted through civilization that nature's to be subdued or ignored so we've got this dualism that's still alive and i think it's a part of the dualism that then supports the worst kind of fundamentalism that we have today, worse than any form of religious fundamentalism, technological fundamentalism. The belief we're gonna solve the problems uh, primarily through a technology. We've gone from about 6% carbon in the soils of the United States to 3% carbon. Over 10 years ago, I asked Marty Bender to assume it's 1492 the day before Columbus. How much oil could be, how much, how many, cal, what kind of calories could be absorbed? I'm not saying this well. How much, given the current use, what was in the current use of oil, if that were carbon that would be brought back into the soil and into the standing crop of the biomass, and Marty said, what the hell you want to know that for? And then he knew, of course, immediately why. He just said that because he was busy. And uh, <laughs> so he went to work and he came back somewhere between 17 and 30 years worth could be absorbed, closer to 17 than 30. So we say 20 years worth could be absorbed. And uh, so uh, what we have, I think, is a problem. Uh, the, the, the problem of, um, of climate change, I think, began with agriculture. And that was where we got the first uh, pool of energy-rich carbon. And that made civilization possible. If we hadn't got to the soil carbon and started using that, we would not be here now. The next pool was forest carbon about 5,000 years ago that made it possible to smelt the ore for the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. Then, of course, coal 250 years ago or so, Drake's oil well, 1859, natural gas. So what all life forms do is go after energy-rich carbon. And uh, so we, <laughs> the curves for the movement of bacteria on a petri dish that's loaded with sugar or drosophila flies in a fat flask or uh, us is the same. 
So it is what I call the 3.45 billion year imperative. This is what we do. And we've got to figure out a w whether we can be the only species that practices restraint in the use of carbon. And so in my view, we got to put a cap on the, uh, on the use of highly dense carbon and, um, and practice that sort of restraint. Now, I'm going to roll out for you just to give you an appreciation of the kind of carbon. How am I doing on time? Got another uh, seven minutes. <coughs> All right, good. Um, I'm gonna, I, I do this everywhere I go. David Orr laughs at me and so on for having only one prop. You, there you go. Uh -huh. Oh, All right. <laughs> All right. So the lamp the bottom is the wheat plant that started civilization. Uh, that started civilization. This is the. Uh, first perennial grain in the history of humanity. This is our Kernza. But what I want you to notice is here's where the plow cut, and that's carbon. That's the beginning of the of climate change. And that's a 10,000 year old beginning. So uh, this also appears in pictures. So in my view, there's only one economy, and that's nature's economy, and that's the natural ecosystem. And what we did when we had the biblical fall is by cutting that, we cut nature's economy, and we've been experimenting ever since. So if we're to, uh, put that down. So if we're to uh, solve the problem, uh, then I think we're going to have to um, use the ecosystem as the conceptual tool and have that move into the social political realm uh, uh, using the ecosystem as analogs for having an economy that is not phony, uh, an economy that features material recycling and runs on contemporary sunlight. Now how much time? Five. All right. Um, now, for us to do this breeding, use computers, we're able to develop perennial grain, something our ancestors could not do. So we've asked ourselves this question. We're using fossil fuel, we're using the computers, we're using a lot of high-tech technology, tremendous computational power, and we know that the lines go up for population, they go up for use of all sorts of resources. They go up, 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 even as we all go down. And we're contributing to that hump. The question is, when you get on the other side of that hump, have you come up with something that's dependent upon the density of the energy and the technology? And we're saying no. On the other side of the hump, those new species and varieties will have their creaturely life and they will be available for even Stone Age creatures, Stone Age people. The industrial world can't say that. And that to me is something we've got to think through. Because how many of these technologies, whether they're solar collectors or wind machines or whatever, are we depending upon the scaffolding of civilization to keep them repaired, because they too will experience the second law. So I'm not coming out against it. What I am saying is we got to think through why it is that nature's economy tends to feature the creaturely life in dealing with the atmosphere, the water, the Earth's crust. So I think we got to get rid of the word Turn it into a four-letter word, if you want. Biosphere. Drop it. And take the word ecosphere that shows the relationship between the physical and the bio biological. Because what we've done by focusing on bio with a bio bias, then we play fast and loose with the physical. Mm. 
consider the atmosphere, the water, the Earth's crust. So from this day forward, not a one of you, every one of you that I'm going to have you personally arrested <laughs> if you say biosphere one more time and uh, throw you in jail for a long time. Uh, this is just sort of the beginning to think about what our relationship is uh, with the earth. And, uh, and I have more to say, but I better quit. Uh, Good. You have a minute. To right? minute. We can ask you questions now for five or six minutes. Michelle or Joan, do you have a question of Wes and his 50 year farm bill? I don't know what happens next, Wes. You can sit down, Wes, and tell you us what happens down, next. So, so you didn't, we don't know what happens next. Yeah. We'll give you back a minute to tell us what happens next. Well, I think that we, given that we now see the perennials on the horizon, we now have the hardware to take all of that knowledge off the shelf that's been gathered out of that broad discipline of ecology and evolutionary biology. There are the National Science Foundation established 26 long-term ecological research sites starting in 1980, millions of dollars spent, not just going back to 1980, but going back, you know, at the beginning of the last century. And it sits there unable to be applied because as long as you're dealing with those annuals, you got the wrong hardware. And I'm talking about the grains now. If we're with the vegetables, uh, that's another matter. That's that they. The, so the, can I ask you a follow-up question on that? Your 50-year farm bill really looks at changing the U.S. agricultural system from a market-driven one to an ecologically driven, uh, driven right. system. So farmers will be planting perennials for a 15 to 20-year time horizon, or, or, long. or, or longer. Fine. Yeah. Today's farmers, typically vegetable farmers notwithstanding, um, notwithstanding typically f farm based on commodity prices. So how do you de-link the farmers and the mentalities of farmers to optimize profits um, from their planting cycles? Well, you change the nature of the subsidies for one thing. I mean, there's a good beginning point. Uh, the, uh, the subsidies have a have an awful lot to do with, um, you know, everything from, well, the, the biofuels, for one, and then, of course, the, um, uh, the commodities uh, help offset the balance of payment deficit for foreign oil and all sorts of things. So, you know, we're using food as, well, we've used food even as a weapon. Uh, so, to turn food into something that is meeting local needs uh, is, part of the, um, is part of the transformation we're talking about. Yeah. Wes, I, I have a quick question because I know um, artichokes by nature are perennial and there are seed companies now that have invented the, the annual artichoke. I'm going to assume that you could perennialize other annual vegetable plants as well? Am well, you can, that? but I wouldn't do it. You know, the, the vegetables are only like 4% of the total ag acreage. Uh, and there's not all that much erosion. There's a lot of chemical contamination in, those, uh, in, in the vegetables um, with, the, you know, with the sprays and whatnot. But, you know, we're talking about 70% of our calories grown on 70% of our acreage. Hmm. And that's where the soil erosion is. But if we do see this shift, because everybody is talking about the need to take less of our calories from carbohydrate load and get more of our calories from things like fresh fruits and vegetables, that could shift if, yeah. if, if we're ever successful at doing that. Right. Well, you know, there's a very good reason why grains are 70 percent. Hmm. They're dry and they're storable. Uh, you don't ship watermelons, uh, uh, you know, when, well, you, we do ship watermelons with a lot of fossil fuel, uh, but we're not going to have that uh, kind of uh, luxury uh, off in the future. I think you keep the vegetables for the local uh, as much as possible. And, um, you know, I mean, Joan's done more thinking on that than about anybody I know. 
might be a wonderful transition now okay. to Joan's 15 minutes.